Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Learn with Jason. It has been a it's been a minute. Uh, so I've been out at events. I have been missing the stream terribly. I'm very excited to see all of you back. So today we're going to be talking to Tice Santos. Uh, Tice, how are you doing? How's thanks for coming? Yeah, thank you for having me. It's uh, been awesome. A few last few days, so as you can see, there's some sun behind me, and that's <laughs> always something to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, summertime. right. Like, how often do we get that? I mean, I'm I'm in the Pacific Northwest where sunshine is, you know, kind of a it's that's a, a very rare bonus. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm feeling pretty happy about some sunshine here as well. I'm in the Netherlands, so yeah, we are known for also having a rainy weather almost always. So right. we get a bit happier at this time of the year for sure. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, okay, so I am super excited to have you on the show where we are potentially dealing with a Figma outage at this exact moment. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed and see how it goes. If, if the outage gets to be too much, we may have to reschedule today. So prep yourselves, chat. But... Before we talk about that, let's talk about you. So, Tice, uh, do you want to give us a little bit of a background on yourself for folks who aren't familiar with your work? Yeah, for sure. So, I'm originally from Brazil, uh, but I've been living in the Netherlands uh, for the past seven years. And I've been dedicated to design systems for the past, more or less, four years. Um, and it's been an interesting route, let's say, or path that I've been taking. Um, I got lucky to uh, be hired in a design system team in the previous company in which um, just made me fall in love with this topic. And ever since I've been like developing in it and increasing my knowledge, uh, even hosting events around it, and now working with uh, Div Riots, uh, actually just building products dedicated to uh, help people with a design system and help design system teams. So I can really relate to all the struggles that our team uh, went through in the beginning and now all the things that we're trying to make to help uh, other teams out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the space seems to be just growing like wildfire. We've got so many uh, just, you know, incredible tools from, from you know, the dev focus tools like Storybook uh, to design focus tools. Like we've seen just a, an absolute explosion of tools in just you know, built in stuff in Figma and you get, um, you know, the, the stuff that y'all are doing with like backlight and, uh, and we're going to talk today about another one that I think is, is just so freaking cool. Um, why do you think design systems have seen such rapid growth in the last five years or so? Yeah, that's a, a good question. From my experience, um, even before I started working with design systems or even uh, talking about it like that, like using this terminology, I think it was intuitive for me to think about this reusability and mm. repetition and making patterns, right? So I used to do some web design work, for example, working mm -hmm. with WordPress and stuff. And of course, I've, like many people, come across having to repeat pages and restyle those little buttons because there wasn't such a thing as a concept of a design system or mm -hmm. there was, but, but not that known to everybody. And eventually I think we all come to the same struggle. So designers come to the struggle with having to repeat their work and wanting to facilitate that process. Developers come with the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. Like I'm having to call this, um, you know, open bracket div, close bracket div. This is a button and again and again and copy and paste. And of course, the more copy and paste you do, the more errors uh, eventually down the line you end up getting mm -hmm. or inconsistent designs in a, in a web page or in an app. And I think so for the past five years, everybody's just coming more and more to the conclusion that we shouldn't be repeating ourselves. We should just unify these um, concepts and um, have a, a, an easy way to access them. And of course, the tools then kind of help shape, shape us around that. So for designers, um, we we remember back in the days making a, a design of a web page in Photoshop, right? And then eventually Sketch pops up, which already brings in this different concept of uh, UI design and yeah, like drawing the the things in the page, making it much easier. Mm -hmm. How you layer it, and eventually Figma <laughs> knocks in the door, you know, kicks everybody out of, out of the <laughs> market. <laughs> bringing this idea that 
not only it's easy to make these uh, little rectangles and to order things properly and to name them easily, now you can actually reuse them in a library that other people can access. So if I were to answer like, why is design system growing like that from my personal experience, it kind of feels natural mm. that anybody working with UI design or development of UI just feels this need to have one source, one place to call for and yeah, make use of, of those elements. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, my, my experience with design systems is all indirect, right? I've never worked on a design system team. Um, I've only worked on teams that worked with design systems. And so my, my observation is, uh, I feel like in, you know, 2009, 2010, I can't remember exactly when it came out, but like Twitter released bootstrap. Right. And so yeah. bootstrap was like the only real design system that was out there. It was, it was ready-made component UI kit. You could just pull it in and use it. And everybody did. We saw the, the whole web got bootstrapified. Like everything started to look like bootstrap. And this led to some, some general backlash where people were saying like, Oh, don't use bootstrap, you know, whatever. But, a huge challenge that I've noticed for um, for me personally, as a at the time I was working with a lot of agency work, and for developers working in in smaller teams that don't have huge budgets, is building your own design system is is prohibitively expensive. So we only saw companies like Airbnb had a design system, and IBM had a design system, the the Carbon design system, right? Um, we saw you know these these bigger companies with lots of budgets would dedicate full teams to design systems. And then you see, uh, you know, leaders like, uh, like Gina in the community does a ton of work on design systems and super friendly with Dan Mall does a, a ton of work on design systems. And that was, you know, specialized help. You could hire them to come and help you. Um, but for somebody who's running a team of six and doesn't have huge budgets, you can't build a design system in house. And so you're kind of stuck. There was bootstrap. And then after bootstrap, there was material design and you know, a few other options out there, but ultimately you kind of get stuck with like, okay, well I can use the pre-made thing and I'll, I'll be, I'll be able to customize it a bit, but it'll mostly look like everybody else's stuff. Or I can roll something in house, but everything we make is like very bespoke. Right. And, and for all the reasons you said, that's not a very desirable thing. You don't want to have to hand code all of these different pieces. Um, but as these tools have started to emerge where we've seen like, Figma's here with reusable components and um, you know we've got stuff like people love Tailwind these days because you can you can kind of build out a, a more customized design system without the full build of customization. Um, you've got these these tools for assembling and managing and and exploring your design systems like Storybook and Backlight. Um, you end up with this this kind of rich ecosystem where suddenly all of these things that were only accessible to companies that could do bespoke design system teams. Now you can do it with like a single designer developer who can use all these tools to build this stuff out. And that's, that is really exciting to me. And I, I feel like that's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Cause I don't know if the tools happen because of the interest in design systems or if the interest in design systems is because the tools made them more accessible, but either way, I'm happy it's happening because less and less of the things that we see on the internet look like they are cookie cutter built out of like one centralized design system. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. So, so backlight, uh, I know is not what we're talking about today, but, um, is, is that, are, are you working on backlight specifically, or I, I know you're at div riots, which has kind of a few projects. So yeah. Maybe. Yeah, so we have Backlight as our main um, project, yeah. which is a platform for building, maintaining, documenting pretty much everything around design system. Um, and I actually, the way I like to describe Backlight from my um, designer language is it's like the Figma before developers mm -hmm. because it's, it's this collaborative platform where everybody gets to access the same design system, work on the same files branching methods, like everything connected through GitHub. And there is the design integration. So as a designer, I can now participate with my developer colleagues in embedding my designs in that platform that they are using. And I get to access their platform to see what they're developing and compare it with my designs in Figma, for example. 
Um, so it's yeah, all in one uh, product to help design system teams like the one that you mentioned, you know, small teams with, without much resources to just quickly put together, um, not, no pun intended, but to bootstrap your design system <laughs> um, in a way that, um, yeah, the investment, um, and, and I, I can relate, like why companies uh, before wouldn't put so much money because the design system is not just the, the creation of the component library, right? Maybe you could have one developer to just, you know, put even like base it on NG Bootstrap, for example, and set a component library and, and distribute to the rest of the developer colleagues in, in the product teams. Or you have one designer to, you know, set up a sketch library and uh, distribute to the other uh, product designers. But the thing is, the design system is everything of that and much more. You now mm -hmm. have to document all those patterns. You now have to actually advocate about it and you have to teach people and you have to, well, make changes if there is something broken to it. Hence um, the cost of maintaining a design system right. tends to scare these, uh, these companies a lot. But now that we are making platforms and, and systems for these systems, uh, I think the this maintenance cost and even uh, like the process of documenting everything it's becoming much cheaper because like products like backlight will help you um actually just put that together much quicker than what it used to be like there is one specific situation i remember in, in the previous team where we didn't have such platform so we had developed uh, components like in angular and mm -hmm. As a designer, I really needed to see if the end result of the that coded component actually looked as it was intended, or if it matched what I had in my sketch, right? Because in the end, the product design teams will end up making a beautiful product that the end development doesn't look like it just because that button just isn't correct or that input doesn't look exactly right. So I wanted to see how the developed component looked like. And I had to like run the entire library in my computer. So I had to learn how to, you know, speed up the service. Uh, I, I don't even remember all the details, but like so many terminal windows open, you know, just to start this NPM, start that, blah, 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 blah. So suddenly I had to become a developer just so I could visualize that component. Mm -hmm. And that was until we managed to publish it somewhere. So we made a website, we published that as a form of documentation. But still, like making um, the updates to the the publishing of this documentation, it was a process on itself. It took time. So now the the code of the components were going much quicker ahead. The document the documentation website was far behind because we didn't update it constantly. There was no automated way to do so. The designs in Sketch were out of sync because you know the designer just continued with other work. So it everything suddenly comes out of sync hence yeah like trying to make or making a platform like backlight to have all that happening in life and without much delay in between like uh, you know publishing and, and updating and and everything connected with all the references in one location i think it's what is bringing a, a new light a new future for for design systems in general um, and especially making it uh, accessible to smaller teams as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, and I think that accessibility to small teams is such a an important thing because I, I feel like a lot of the tools that we build, um, they get framed as like, okay, so this will make it more accessible to small teams, but it has the benefit of making it accessible to the sub teams within the large companies that otherwise would have to like, ask the core design system team for, you know, Hey, we need you to fix this thing. And, and, you know, there, then they say, well, we've got 150 tasks on our list from all the teams around the company. And so we'll get to yours when we can, but we can't do it for six weeks. And then the company, the other team is like, okay, well, I guess we'll roll our own then. And then you've got this drift of things get out of sync and broken. And yeah, it's, I, I love this idea of, of shrinking the complexity of working on a design system. And something that I think is really interesting about what y'all are doing over at DivRiots is that you, you've you got, so like Backlight where it's it's code focused. You start with a code and then it kind of moves forward. Um, but then there's another tool that you're working on, uh, the, the story to design, 
which is actually going the other direction, right? Where it's, it's, um, it's like, it works in Figma and it's, it's sort of based on this idea of like the designers need access to these design systems too, and shouldn't necessarily have to meticulously update this whole design system. That's really not the final form of the code. Like, so, so this is actually something that, um, I talked to Dan Mall about this. Let me, let me actually pull up the episode because this was a, a good episode, but, um, Dan Mall came on the show and we talked about design systems. And when he was talking about it, he he was talking about design as being like a it's an incidental piece. It's not a final product, right? The final product is what ships to the users. It's the code that's in the browser. So the designs that we make are trend they're transitive. They're they're he called them trash right and and i thought that was so <laughs> funny coming from somebody who is a designer by trade to say no the design is trash the thing that we need is the the final product here um and and this idea that like if we if we get too precious about the way that our designs work in figma then we're we're creating ceremony and we're creating complexity and and blockers when what we're really trying to do is is quickly get from, I need to make a thing. I have a, a task to build this UI. I need the design to work and I need the code to make the, the page look like this design. And ultimately the product, like what we're shipping is, is the final piece. So I need to shortcut every single piece as much as I can so that the design does not block shipping the code and so that the code doesn't break the design. And this is what I think is kind of interesting about the space that you're in and, and tools similar to backlight and story to design is, is this idea of like, maybe we can create like one universal language where all the pieces are hooked to a, a source of truth. And that source of truth is code, which yeah, is the final no, I product. I completely agree. In, in the end, I think we'll and continue with this reality in which you have dedicated people to code and you have dedicated people to design. Mm -hmm. Of course, more and more we start seeing the unicorns, the ones that can do both, right? Um, a very good developer that is also pretty good in, in UX, UI, or a pretty good designer who is still uh, who also knows how to code pretty well. But if you do let the disciplines focus on what they're good at, then you have really good designers and really good developers. Not to say that the unicorns are not good. I try to be one myself. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's the tools that help bring those two worlds together. And having one source has always been difficult, right? I, we've seen many, many softwares out there trying to generate code from design. That is just not happening. <laughs> it hasn't happened till now. Like you probably remember Dreamweaver <laughs> and some other interesting examples. Right, right. And that is because, of course, uh, when you have a very good designer putting time and effort in making that perfect UX and UI, you want to um, make the most of that. So you just want to be able to extract without like double the time to make that into code by hand. Mm -hmm. But the problem is there's a lot of things that the softwares that try to bring design to code that they end up missing out on. For example, it's very hard to generate the specific uh, the details on, on the code for accessibility, mm. right? When you extract that beautiful landing page that you designed um, and the navigation menu, for example, it would be very hard for you in the design to highlight, hey, this is a nav item that should be read like this by the, the um, browser reader and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So I think... When you try to export from um, design, when you try to generate some code from it, it can be useful when it's like a very quick and dirty thing. Like mm -hmm. you're just creating um, a landing page that is very simple content. You're going to throw it away very soon anyway. So great. You don't have to worry. Like you don't rely on um, accessibility or you don't depend on that page uh, being um, like scoring well on seo for example so all these mm. details that live within the code it doesn't mean anything to you so go ahead and gen try to generate code from design at least it gives you so something or right. if you want need to like a high fidelity prototype so it's very useful in a ux workflow when you're doing usability tests and you don't have the development time of your company or you're just really in a hurry to to get that in the hands of end users and see their reaction to your ux a high fidelity prototype is great and 
the ones that get exported from, let's say, Figma to React very quickly, amazing. At least you get that in the end of the users. But that would never be your end product. <laughs> you probably cannot use that in right. your final developed uh, code, right? Yeah. And yeah, that, that's I, and, why and this is definitely remember. like, you know, we're, we're seeing folks in the chat are kind of talking about different things like, you know, tail, Tailwind is, is giving people the ability to learn more about design if you're not a designer. And people are kind of joking about using Dreamweaver for folks who have been around for a while. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately, I, what I what I've found very fascinating is that especially with modern web development, the it's not as siloed as it was before, where you have like a designer and then you have a developer and they're they have no overlap um because i remember when i first started where you know a design was like the thing that you cut up into slices and then you stuck those into a table so that they looked the way that they were in your design doc um and there was you know there was no real like design you weren't using your eyeballs you were just like okay i'll slice it into this grid and then i'll stick that into a table and and you know border collapse and okay great now it looks like the design um but today, even when you have a design system, you're still thinking about like, okay, I need to assemble these pieces and, and like, you know, these components are going to sit next to each other. And, and we've got lots of guidelines, but, but, you know, designers have to think about what this looks like in code. How does my design translate to code? I can't, I can't put 19 blend modes on because while that might work in browsers today because of, of modern browser support, there are limitations. Like I was trying to do something the other day where I thought it would be really fun to have like a blend mode here and then a drop shadow on it. And it turns out when you do that in the browser, like drop shadows behind blend modes get weird. They don't do what I wanted. And I was super sad about it because I had to go rework my design. But designers have to be aware of these things now. And developers need to be thinking about the design as well because you don't get handed a slice up thing. You get handed a, a like a lot of times a partial, like I want the header to look like this and then use our components to build out the, the main content body. Or, you know, here's the, here's the new component and like use our existing components to build out the rest of the design. And now you've got to think about that as a, as a developer, how to kind of assemble these pieces. Um, that like, and as we see that the, the, it's no longer like a Venn diagram where it's two separate circles. We're seeing a lot of overlap between design and development. And, you know, I personally, I love that because I like doing a little bit of design. I like doing a little bit of development. It makes me feel Thank like you. I'm learning and improving to do those things. But I know that a lot of people feel like they're firmly in one camp or the other. Um, and I love seeing in the chat, you know, watching y'all talk about how you're, you're learning about design through doing certain types of code or, or vice versa. Um, I think that's like, that's super exciting to me. It feels like we're all leveling yeah. up as a, a direct yeah. result of this. Exactly. Like to, to have these um, other libraries being available, also being presented to designers in a nice way, like the guys are mentioning Tailwind, it definitely brings up uh, the knowledge to, to the world of designers as well. So it's a Tailwind, I would say a heavily developer oriented library, mm -hmm. but many are now using it as an inspiration or as, as their base, their fundamentals for setting up their own uh, thinking or the brand guidelines around it, the, the similar way that Tailwind set up a standard for for the rest and of course we have uh, the discussions around um design tokens which is growing now i would say more than design system even like it's part of design system but it's becoming a universe on itself where you now have to start thinking of uh, how are you going to convert all these design elements into um, very generic terms that can be translated to any technology and any um type of communication really so design tokens come as an awesome way to move things forward into also not only blending the design and developer world mm. but also merging all the different tools that we have so now you can work with react components or angular or you can work in figma or you can work in sketch because in the end everything is just one big json file that it's uh, <laughs> accessible to any technology and all you need to do now is find ways to transform that information. So it's, that's really it's all exciting one, as well. It's all one big JSON file feels like, <laughs> like a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> like that's it. That, that's it. Yeah, it's all just one big JSON file. Um, no, I, I love that. <laughs> I, but you're absolutely right. Um, and, and so, okay. So 
the, the challenge that we're up against today is uh, I'm looking at the, the Figma status page and yep, I'm it is to looking Figma like Figma is here. in the middle of a, a service disruption. So it is, um, yes. I, th I think Wh we're going to... It's something interesting because like, you know, not every day I'm working with Figma and we are like testing this plugin, like really forcing Figma to its best and never have we had any troubles. And then today, this is the law. This is the law of live demos. Like, if there's something you can do to to make sure that your demo doesn't work, the universe is gonna line it up for you. So. Yeah, <laughs> and I didn't even make screenshots to like maybe we could just walk you a presentation or something. Of course, it's not as fun. No, no, it's I okay. Mean, so, so here's what we're gonna try. I want to take us over to pair programming mode, and chat. We're just gonna we're just gonna make a best effort at this. If Figma is not cooperating, we will uh, we will end early with the discussion and we'll reschedule this and and come back on a day that Figma is up and running so that we can do uh, the the full walkthrough of how all this works. Um, but let's just hop on over into our other view here, camera two. And now uh, what I'm going to do is get the the inception off the screen. And so here's, yeah, here's what we're up against right now. Um, some users are unable to access Figma. So before we dig deeper here, let's talk a little bit about our, uh, our captioning and sponsors. We've got Vanessa here from White Coat Captioning today, taking down all these words. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for being here uh, and making this, this show a little more accessible to more people. Uh, let me drop a caption link here. If you wanna read the captions, they are on the homepage of the site. That is made possible through the support of our sponsors. We've got Netlify, NX, and Backlight. And if y'all were watching the uh, the New Relic Future Stack event last month, um, you'll you may have noticed that New Relic is also coming on as a sponsor. I'm super excited about that. We are buttoning up the paperwork, and and we'll join them. Uh, we'll have them up here very very soon. So thank you to all of our sponsors for for making this show more accessible to more people. Um, and we are talking to. Tice today. So this is twitter.com and then it's th4. There we go. So here That's is me. a link if you want to go follow Tice on Twitter for more information about uh you know all this all this good stuff. Um should we roll the dice with Figma? Let's try. Let's I haven't tried Figma in the browser. I have mine open as an app. Oh. Oh, this okay. It's letting me in. Let's That's let's see. That's a good sign. Um, all right, so if I want to get started, we're, so today we're specifically talking about story to design, right? Yes. And so if I want to get started, let me drop a link for the chat if they want to follow along. Um, maybe we can talk just really quickly as I'm looking at the homepage here. Let's, let's give a, a high level overview of specifically what story to design is doing. Sure. So Story to Design is a team effort uh, for quite some time, actually, within Div Riots. Uh, we did see this need to bring code back to design. So we don't intend to get in the way of that process, which is common in design system teams in which the designer defines how the component looks like. So okay. we still think that that might be the case sometimes, right? You're, um, you came across a need of a component, you want to style it, you go ahead, you make the definitions, but then you have to hand that over to your developer and then your developer will code it. And that's what we consider the source of truth because no matter how much you define the style of the component, you will actually, uh, what gets to the product is what ended up being developed. So with story to design plugin, we want to bring that developed back to Figma. Um, right. And in the future, possibly other applications as well. So yeah, that's how it works. Very easy. We are going to install the plugin. We're going to link your storybook stories and uh, we're going to start generating variants. So by bringing it back from code, we intend to now make this link between code and design. So when there is any change in the code, your designs can get updated. So you can continue working with your library um, because basically the link is there. Great. Okay. So, I, so uh, I'm, I'm logged into Figma here 
and yeah. I just clicked the install button. So I'm in the, the Figma plugin directory here and I've just installed uh, story to design. And now where we can should... start a new file? I can start a new file. All right. So a new design yeah. file. Yeah, correct. Okay. So in this scenario, um, let's say um, you are the designer and uh, your team has already set up a storybook stories for your component library. So we already went uh, over that uh, process of maybe the designers defined the definitions and then headed over. Now everything is coded and it's documented. And um, well, you're probably very familiar with storybook, right? I'm, I am familiar with storybook, yeah. So what's your interpretation of storybook? What is storybook to you? So what I've seen storybook uh, is it's once you have built a design system and you've got all your code, you can create stories for each component and storybook will uh, take that component, display it and give you an ability to look at the various variants and um, modifications that you can make. You can mess with the props and that lets you kind of try out a design system component before you put it into your code. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, I mean, that's also my interpretation of it. It's uh, from my experience on the technical side, sometimes uh, it's a lot that needs to be done on the background from developers, mm -hmm. but it's definitely um, the, the standard that we're going forward with design system teams as the, the place, the resource for everybody to uh, re reference and, and to come try out the components. Um, so Similar to Storybook, we have Backlight, as you have in one of, our, of your um, streams uh, with George. Backlight, um, like what we mentioned before, being the, the full-on design system platform, um, it also handles the stories, so the CSF format that Storybook also uh, handles. So all that very uh, basically is what is needed for the plugin to uh, start making uh, variants from, from the code. So in the scenario that we're in, you're the designer, and let's say you work with uh, Audi, you know, the, the brand, uh, the car brand? Yeah, Audi. Yes, Here it is. Audi. <laughs> cool. So Audi has a design system uh, showcase inside Storybook website. So actually, if you go to storybook.js, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, it's Storybook. And you go to showcase. Showcase. Yes, so we have um, view all storybooks, the oh, UI right React all the, yes, there we go. So this is a, a great place to just pick up a, a publicly available storybook link that okay. will work really well with the plugin right now. So then we can kind of look in so, here and see, uh, exactly. let's see, what's a, what's a good, like, here's a button. All right, let's look at a button. Well, that's a radio button. The a radio above. button. That's probably not the one I want. Let's look at a button. <laughs> yes, buttons Go to the are overview. the best component examples. So here's a primary yeah. button, a secondary button, a text only button. Uh, we can go to variations yep. and see different sizes, have different states. Sizes. Yep. Okay. Um, you can check the checkbox, for example. Checkbox also interesting. Which checkbox? Component. On your left um, menu, you have a checkbox as well. Oh, oh, I was looking for like yeah. a checkbox to click. <laughs> <laughs> Something to check. <laughs> no. Yeah, so we got, yeah. here's, you know, here's this. And if we go into variations, we can see yeah. the idle, disabled, read only, error, um, yeah. different options and stuff. So yeah, this this all is, these are all things that I would expect from a design system. And this is, you know, this is what people like about Storybook is you... I can go in and see very, very quickly what's available to me, right? Yeah. Um, and this and is what all design system tools will do, is give us one of these, um, or at least that's what they promise to do, right? Is we get to look yeah. at, at what's in the design system, how does it work, how do I use it? And if I go in here and I wanna actually just use this, I can hit show code, and now I've got like, boom, here we go. There's my, there's my checkbox code. I can drop that straight in and it just works. Um, and so this, right. you know, this is very exciting to me because it all makes sense. Um, and then is this one of the ones that lets you edit too? Like if you want to play? Um, sometimes I think if you are on the, um, yeah, over there and you're in controls on the tab next accessibility. Mm -hmm. So that's where you can start playing with some of the things. So, um, and once you change, then it should update up there. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we can so, start yeah. messing with it. And then if we go look at the code, I think, which I always forget where these buttons are. Cool. So basically really the challenge is you can imagine now yourself as a designer, you have this beautiful library that all the developers have access to. They can copy that little piece of code and start using it straight away. But now you want to have the same thing in Figma so you can start designing it away. What do you do? I, honestly, I have no idea what I would do. I like, <laughs> well, cause, cause this feels to me like this is sort of, I would expect that the designers probably have an identical Figma file that's just got all of these things. And then whenever they change it, they have to send it to the developers so the developers can open that up, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, what some of the big companies do in their design system is sometimes provide an accompanying Figma file, for example. So that is the case, right? You also have, let's say, if your design system is a public one, not only you give away like the library, the code library, but also you provide some files, but somebody has to maintain all that. And it often comes out of sync or it gets outdated very easily. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the challenge here is as a designer, if I now want to make a design for all the um, digital services, I would have to uh, go myself and draw all these squares, type all this typography and you know go do it by hand. Mm -hmm. So luckily now we have story to design as a, a savior for our situation. So we can very easily actually um, with the plugin ready installed, now start importing all these uh, stories back to Figma. So if okay. you go back to I'm your file. Back to my file. Let's open story to design plugin. So to plugins. Open plugin, yeah. Here. There you go. That's it. Um, so I just need to get your access token. Just give me one second. I thought I had saved it here. So uh, just to explain a little bit. So story to design right now is in a private beta um, situation. So we have um, several companies that we are working with. Mm -hmm. They're in our uh, beta program to fine tune the software. And um, Bit by bit, we're improving it and making it um, more interesting per use case, so making sure that we cover all the needs of these different um, um, companies. And uh, yeah, it's one of the ways to get into uh, the private beta with us is to schedule a demo. So you could go to the website and schedule it and see if this is a use case for you that we could work together. Great. And you will get an access token for it. Okay. So give me one second. So here, how can I send you this access token? Uh, if you actually use the call we're in right now, there's a chat window. All right, cool. Chat over here. So with your email, uh, the Jason at length, length, fork, length off. How do you say your last name? Langstorf. Langstorf, sorry. <laughs> Jason okay. at Langstorf.com. Um, and with the access code I just sent you on the chat. Okay, so I'm going to pull this off screen while I add the token. Yeah. Okay, and now uh, in my best hacker voice, I'm in. Um, <laughs> so I've got my, uh, here's my react.ui.audi because it's asking me for a storybook URL. And so I just. Correct. Boom. Yeah. Good. And press enter. Connect. Perfect. So as you could see in the previous screen, um, we have support for both uh, Storybook and Backlight. So Backlight being uh, the other product. Um, and yeah, Storybook is there. So now one thing that is nice to see, um, under the components, like you can expand that, everything that you see here is what you see inside that Storybook link that mm -hmm. we were at with all the and so I just, if I want to give ring something in, so I want to bring in this button, I just hit the play button. Well, right now you are in a section called explore stories. So okay. let me walk you through these two parts of the UI. Right above we have components with mm -hmm. a big blue button called import new components. Ah. So that's the one for actually generating the, the useful variance components that we are going to use in our 
final designs. So over here, if you want to go ahead, let's just create a button that we saw in the uh, storybook. What we need to do is define um, the, the different arc arcs that make up that button. So uh, for those who are familiar with Figma, they know you can create one component with several variants, right? And normally it's done for the different uh, styles, like the size of the button, the um, um, type, like primary, secondary typography, or for the different, um, what else, like success, warning. So, so there are many ways to think about a button and how to organize the, this matrix. And what the plugin is gonna do for you is actually going to define all that um, by, for the selection that we get in the storybook stories. Um, so oh. just before we start selecting everything, because you will see that at the end, the more you select, the more crazy the number you will get. So okay. go, go to the bottom of this uh, list. I think I froze it. Oh. Oh, wait, uh, here we go, oh, okay. we're good, we're good. Okay, <laughs> so let me let me just start so you <laughs> unchecking some look, things. You're selecting all of them. <laughs> look at how many variants you would. <laughs> <laughs> Four million seven hundred eighteen thousand five hundred ninety-two variants in my list. Okay, that's maybe a bit much. That that's not a very good idea. But <laughs> since I've I've uh, worked with the Audi design system uh, and importing here in Storybook, let me show you why this is a little bit strange. So go back to Audi's uh, Storybook link here. Yes, and let's go to the button. Oof da! All right, and, so that's uh, exciting. You can go in properties. Properties. Yes, so you see those properties that are listed on the right under control. Mm -hmm. um, these definitions are basically uh, the th the things that the developer can do to the button to like pick up the different options, right? So this is all information that uh, yeah, when you play with it over there, you see what it changes. But if you continue a little bit further down, if I'm not mistaken, uh, da, 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 da. spacing, this one. So oh. from my understanding, and I'm not part of all these design system team, I think what they have is sort of a, um, a spacing system that they use it in every single component. But when you change it over here, you will see not much changed in the button itself because this is probably as you're implementing the button and you're spacing it with other elements on the page, you're gonna use this, you're gonna stack it. So this is more like in the works for maybe the layout of the product. Right. And it doesn't really impact the component itself. So it's an option here in Storybook, but for us in the plugin, it's not really interesting. So we're not gonna select those. And okay, so I want the size, this, and now like we've got twenty four variants there, and I probably yeah. want this variant. Yeah. Okay, that's seventy two. Um, do Go, we want the uh, type? Go up a bit. Let me see which one you selected on the top. You selected also the disable. It's an interesting one. Uh, I can um, in loading for now. We we can unselect those, and I'll tell okay. you in a little bit. But that's the hover state. The hover state, I think it might be interesting. And uh, the focus state, maybe. Let's see. Okay, 36. 36. That seems like a reasonable number. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Go ahead and click import component. Okay, we're importing. Hopefully Figma is still working. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so as the plugin is doing its magic in the background, mm -hmm. It actually doesn't stop us from making selections on the following components that we want to import. Because in the end, our goal is to set up an entire library, not just buttons. Mm -hmm. So you can click that button again and go on the top. Let's select now the next one, maybe a badge. Let's uh, make up some badges. Let's select the stories. So for the badge, those sizing is not interesting, but variant for sure. And badge is a component that doesn't normally have an interaction. So the hover state, focus state doesn't really, yeah, it's not in, really interesting. So let's just import four. Okay. Uh, let's go for the next one. Maybe let's go to, let's make the um, checkbox. Yep. And select some arguments. And uh, let's go for checked, for disabled. 
for invalid. I think that's more uh, like a technical one that um, visually is not going to really show you anything, if okay. I remember correctly. So this is an interesting part, right? As a designer and a developer, and I'm going through this plugin, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to talk to the developer. I still need to understand their reasoning and what are the definitions that they defined in the component and is that relevant for my visual design or not? Um, and for the checkbox, it's interesting to see the um, focus state. Yeah, so I would import those. Okay. So as you could see, um, the buttons are ready. Let's okay. go ahead and create them. Wow. Okay. And badge. Boom. Badge. It's created and checkbox. Checkbox created. Okay. You so can I'm, close the I'm coming out here. Now. I want to look. Okay. So based on this, and I need to change the background color. Let's it's see. It's on your I... right over there on your panel. Oh, background. Here we go. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's make this a little you bit. You have Figma on the dark mode. <laughs> Right, so we've got uh, now each of these show. Oh, okay, so it tells us all of the the components. So text disabled, whatever, whatever. This is all good. All right, yep. so now I can kind of see like here's my disabled states, and um, yep. this looks like a hover state. This is maybe an active state uh, or focus state. Okay, come over here. Here are badges. What and color are you? Or is that a, just a white badge? That's a that's a missing badge. Okay. Um, yeah. And then we have. I would have to see what. Check boxes. So this looks like standard. This looks like. Uh, that's the focus one. Probably. Focus mode disabled. Cool. Yep. All right. So the way Figma works is these are like the the raw version of the component where mm -hmm. a design system person or the maintainer of this library will be uh, working around here. But for the designers in the the rest of the teams, the product designers, what they are really interested in is the assets tab that you have there on your left panel. So when you go next to layers assets and you open up components, so these are the components for them. So oh, hover on the button. If you hover on the button one, you, you see there is also a description there. This description came from the storybook, so that's something that the plugin does for us as well. Um, yes, that description. So cool. if the storybook is set with the description, uh, the plugin will import like the the visual representation of that button, but also any other relevant information that mm -hmm. uh, we can make use of in Figma. So for documentation purposes, this is great because now you also have no diversion of what is being documented for developers and what's being documented for designers. Everybody's talking the same language. So to use this component, actually, you can just drag it into the empty space in your there. So this is actually just the, the component um, that a designer would go ahead and make their UI. So you can select your variant from text. You can select the primary, secondary. Oh, look at this, y'all. Okay, so this, like, this was already cool because I was like, oh yeah, I can just grab the one that I need. But so here, I can I can just work on. Uh, oh, let's disable it. Nope, that's fine. Okay, let's make the the medium one. All right, that's good. Uh, I want it to be focused. Okay, there's my my focus outline, um, and it, it's easier to see with the secondary. So if we go here. And then we do the the focus outline, right? Yep. Uh, and then we can do a hover. Yep. I don't know what the hover does. It's. Oh, it, like, I think it changes the color a little bit. I yeah. get it. Okay. But also, just go to the component on the storybook itself. You will see that it's exactly the same. So now, cool. don't judge how this focus state or this hover state looks like, because if you don't think it's great, well, that was the design the system team definition, right? So maybe. They need to change it. It's not a right. plugin. Um, there is one more thing that is really cool about buttons specifically. Uh, so one of the great features from Figma is the fact that you can build these components in a very usable way. Okay. So before with Sketch, um, like to make a button, you would have to make a text um, frame or a text item and then mm -hmm. put a rectangle around it. But every time that you typed in the... Uh, the text, the rectangle would not adapt to that size. So now, if you double click where it's written button action, and you just change that, you see how the button is like growing with it? Yep. So that's 
I mean, it's, it's a bit of a normal thing for anybody used to Figma right now, but for those who started with design systems before right. the auto layout option, this is kind of awesome. So yeah, these buttons made by the plugin are already coming with auto layout. Extremely cool. So, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this, this is kind of what I've always dreamed of when I'm, when I'm working with these sorts of systems is that like, you know, I, I always have these high hopes of creating a design system and then I'll start and then I start designing in the browser with like code and then I kind of drifts and then I'm like, I'm not going to go back and update all that. Um, and so this is pretty interesting that what we're seeing is like, if I want to build out a, a quick prototype, you know, I can just grab these, these things and say like, all right, I'm going to, you know, build out a, a quick thing of saying like, Okay, we've got option one, right? Oops. And then we've got yep. option two. All right. Yep. Now I want this one to be checked. So I'm going to check the box. And, you know, yep. like this is just extremely cool that we're able to to put all of this together so quickly um, because it just feels like, you know, if I had to build this form by hand, I'll tell you what would happen is I wouldn't build it. I would, I would like procrastinate on this until some, and basically until my manager was like actually standing over my shoulder being like, do this. And I'm like, fine, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, so, you know, no, or exactly. I would do what I used to do at IBM, which is I would find somebody else who had built almost the same UI and I would copy paste their code and just hope that yep. they followed the rules because I'm certainly not going to go check. Yeah, exactly. So uh, there is another interesting feature of this plugin, which is it's great to be able to import these components, but what if something changes? Mm -hmm. So right now what I'm going to describe to you is the change coming from code. I see in the chat that there are some questions about the design I wanted to change, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, but for example, uh, so you open the, the plugin again uh, with the right click on the um, Figma file. Sorry, you're going to have to say that one more time. Just up, 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 sorry, open the plugin with, oh, you I can you. do it through the menu or right click actually. There you go. <laughs> um, there is a three dots over there, exactly. So if let's say um, your developer colleague in all the design system decided, or well, the whole team decided that your buttons are no longer square, they're going to be rounded. They can easily update the code for them. It's usually like often cases, some of the style changes for, for the components is really just one line of code. For mm -hmm. designer, you could picture it. It would be like 36 little squares that you'd have to update back in the old days. But now with a story to design, when that change ha happens in code, we can come back here, click update, and boom, we would get that update. So, And when we do that update, because this is set up as a component and because these are built from that component will update all of this and every usage of it so yep. right. and what's interesting about that is this might be the first tool that i've seen that aligns incentives around this because when like when i was working with other design systems because there was no like automatic update there was not really a high penalty for just, I'll just make a copy of this and change it to fit my design. And now it's not, no longer linked to the component. It's all kind of like, well, whatever. But nobody cared because there wasn't a central component. There wasn't anything. But with this, now the incentive is don't break the components because you'll lose your automatic updates. Yep. That's, that's exactly a cool right. incentive. So actually, if, for example, in this button that you inserted, so that's an instance of the button, right? The one mm -hmm. that is click to boop. Um, you could here hard code a radius. So on your right panel, there is a little radius symbol. So let's say you put 30 or whatever value there. Um, so what you're doing is you're just um, overriding a instance of a component inside mm -hmm. Figma. This component is still somewhat connected to that component above, right? So so that group that we see around the dotted purple square, that's still like the same component. But because you overrode that radius, you now sort of lost this connection. So whatever happens to the radius of the original component 
what persists is your overwrite because but that's a feature from figma figma mm -hmm. understands that hey if you needed to overwrite this in this instance you probably needed it so but to to your point on like the incentive to not having to overwrite anything that's exactly right so now if designers are making these uh, forced changes in their figma file or their figma instances that means something needs to change at the essence of it and if it needs to change for them it probably needs to change for everybody mm -hmm. hence you should probably do it in the code anyway so we would uh, suggest that in the process of like oh hey the designer wants to change something the component circle back with the developers like find your process in which how do you suggest make suggestions for changes how do you experiment with these suggestions and then once it's been approved you know branched merged like everything tested then you can receive your update back again in your official figma library which is this one generated by the plugin mm -hmm. so to say that another way to make sure that i'm understanding the the recommendation here is because the code is the source of truth, changes don't get made in Figma, changes get made in code. And so Correct. what what we're saying is if the designer decides we should have a rounded version of the button where we're going to say, you know, you like, okay, we want the, the border radius to do whatever that is so that we've got a round button, we need to go back to the the team and say, all right, we're going to introduce this rounded version of the button. Here's a mock-up of it. What code do we need to add to this component so that there is a, a option here to say like, is this button rounded, true or false? For example, if you wanted that it's like a additional variation of your button, mm -hmm. correct? That would be the case. But also if it's something to just completely change the style of the, of the button throughout your application, you would force that change. And then once you hit the update, uh, you would inherit that inside mm -hmm. Figma once again. So to answer the questions in the chat, uh, right now there is not a way for a designer to make a change to the variant. If they need to make a change, they probably should request it to the developer. If it's a change in regards to your usability within Figma, so it's not to do with the, the design system as such, but more the way Figma works, um, well, this is why we are in a beta stage right now to kind of pick up on these requests and see which scenarios would we have to sort of open up these generated component to allow for a designer intervention just because they need it. So I think, of course, in, in the end, we probably need to take a path, right? And our path right now is the source lives in the code. We bring it back to Figma, hence one way street for mm -hmm. now. But the plugin can evolve, the way we think about components can evolve, and therefore there is always room for thinking, well, maybe, you know, in these instances, in these scenarios, here the designer should have an input or should have a flexibility to make some changes within Figma right. that don't impact the code, for example. Yeah, and and I think, you know, the you're bringing up something that's kind of interesting, which is, um, you know, when we talk about, like, data flow, or information flow this is something that we we talk about in in code in general is like if you know if you want to have really predictable updates then you know you have data flow one direction you you have you know the the like react data flows down you start at the top and you add props and you re-render and every time the data changes you re-render again and so if if we're looking at it the same way what we're basically saying is the 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 code is where the information comes from go away um, the code mm -hmm. is where the information comes from and we need to like make sure that the changes only happen in code and that flows down to the design and to the storybook and to the UI because they're all using the same source of truth. And that is a, it's a shift. I think, I think it's something that companies would have to discuss and get on the same page about because it adds what I would say is a, a, not a, a limitation but a communication constraint where you can't, you can no longer have your designers and your developers in walled boxes where they don't speak to each other anymore. They, they have to become much more collaborative. And really, if you talk to any expert, 
like when we had Dan Mall on the show, the whole thing he was talking about is like design is not a phase. Design is part of the dev process. You have the designer and the dev sit together and they collaborate and sometimes they're in code, sometimes they're in Figma and you don't, you know, you kind of have to just collaborate because it's not the sort of thing that gets solved all in one place or the other. You need to use the right medium and then it ends as code. Um, so this is interesting because this takes the, the practice, what we're seeing experts recommend about how to manage a design system with this very collaborative process. And it provides constraints and guidelines and incentives with like, hey, if you do it this way, you automatically get Figma files. You automatically get synced updated components. And the only thing that you need to change is that you, you don't update the Figma file, you update the code and then sync the Figma file. Yep. No, that's can, exactly it. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd be and, chat. How, I mean, how many designers are in the chat today? Like how, what, how does this feel to you? What are, what are your, what are your initial thoughts? Like looking at the chat, it looks like we've got people saying, you know, uh, Andy says, this is amazing. And Jan BF is saying, uh, you know, this is, this is super awesome. Uh, what if the designer wants to make changes? We talked about that. Uh, I see Henri. What's up, Henri? Um, you know, Tony, Tony's got questions. Uh, King 440 is talking about Figma. Figma is a design tool. That's what you're looking at on screen right now. Um, yeah. It's we the actually new have Photoshop. A, I, I love we've, so we're almost at uh, 300 episodes of Learn with Jason now. And wow, a very exciting, that's so cool. a very exciting part of that is we're starting to get to the point where there's an episode. Why doesn't my keyboard work? What is happening? Hello? My, oh, this little punk keeps trying to take focus. The That's software update. Okay. Um, <laughs> my, my software update is really being a jerk today. So we have an episode on Figma. Introduction to Figma oh, for developers nice. uh, from Ryan Warner. Uh, oh, that's so cool. I have to watch that one. But uh, yeah, you know, we've got we've got a lot of a lot of good options. Uh, George, who was on the show, we linked to the, the episode about um, backlight with George earlier and is saying that, uh, you know, it's a loop. You you request changes on Figma files, update the design system main, which is the code, and that flows back into the Figma files. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, NMZ64 depends on the level of the designer and dev. Sometimes devs understand mockups with extensive docs. Other times it takes much more handholding for them to grasp some concepts. Um, yeah, agree that it needs to be collaborative and not just a handoff. I think that's kind of at the bottom of all of it, right? Is unless you are owning this completely end to end, you're the designer and the developer, it's not the sort of thing where you're just going to get a design anymore. You're you're going to talk to the designer as part of developing it, and you need that feedback loop. And really, the earlier yeah. that starts, the more collaborative, the better the end result is going to be. And one additional benefit from using um, a library that is generated by the plugin is the terminology and the naming conventions. Now it's all one because mm -hmm. what happens often is a designer is dedicated building a library, setting up names and even like uh, sentence casing and all the different you know mm -hmm. details to, to organize their library. And the developer is also doing the same thing, but with their own knowledge and their own experience. And the sooner you know, you will get two different things for calling the same component. Like um, a, a good example is the tooltip. Some people call it, so a developer will call it a tooltip. A designer might call it a, a pointer. I don't know, like you know, different names come start coming up for the same components. Mm -hmm. So when you um, use a library that you're inheriting from code, it's all the same name. Um, it's uh, an extra benefit is the um, you inheriting that structure that the developer defined, which hopefully he defined with the help of the designer. So if you go to all these uh, storybook link, for example. Sorry, the the storybook link. Yeah, there we go. So how these uh, this design system team organize, you know, the grouping, they call it components, and then they go into buttons and, and all the, that um, naming convention gets now pushed to Figma. So everybody's talking about the same thing. So that's definitely a, an added benefit as well. That's a, I mean, that's a great point. Like I, I've spent a huge amount of time uh, in meetings 
where we were arguing about something. And at the end of it, what we realized is that we were talking about exactly the same thing, but we use different words for what that thing was. And, you know, word like names for things is extremely hard because a lot of times, like the biggest challenge in, in large teams is that we don't have the right shared vocabulary because we never took time to write those definitions. So if we're going to, to communicate effectively, a lot of times you have to force this big meeting where everybody involved has to sit down and argue about like, well, is it, you know, like a, a big one is you say agile. Right. And like half the room goes, Ooh, never agile. And the other half goes, yeah, we have to be agile. But really what we all want is like, yeah, we should work on things a little bit and then measure what the outcome is and then make more decisions uh, because nobody really doesn't want to do that. They just have different memories attached to the word agile or the word sprint or, or things like that. Um, but you have to work through that pain. And so what this is doing is actually interesting where in the, in the context of a design system, through the collaborative process of building it, you're forcing shared vocabulary, like you said. And now you can't have that disconnect where like the executive is saying, do the little, the balloon bubble. And the designer's yeah, like, exactly. oh, I know what that is. That's a, that's a pop out. And the, that's you know, a the, the developer, yeah, the developer's <laughs> like, well, wait, hold on. But we only have the fly out and they're all talking about exactly the same thing. <laughs> and they, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So um, there is also um, another feature from the plugin. So if you go back to your Figma file, I'd just like to point it out in, in this, um, yeah, in, in the thought process of yeah, naming conventions and keeping things in sync. So when we open the plugin again, um, we have that second step underneath the, the explore stories, right? Mm -hmm. So because you were asking me at first, so what's this one? Uh, when you hit play button, and you can do it to all of them at the same time, this is just the plugin processing the information behind. When you do it for, to the buttons, for example, oh, for the buttons. what this, the plugin is going to do is it's going to calculate all the stories that um, is inside that storybook link. And it will eventually outline it for us as a documentation piece. So I really like this feature on the Explore Stories as a process to maybe um, even validate that what got developed matches what I intended and mm. what are the different variants that I have um, available for me to make a component of. Um, so hopefully this is not, yeah, there you go. We can check the avatar. Click okay. Portal Should Stories. Just import. Yeah. There you go. So now you can close the, the plugin because it gets in the way usually. There's no way to minimize the plugin, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And they kind of just uh, paste it on top of everything else so you can drag them around to kind of clear up the space for yourself. Yeah. There you go. So you, you zoom in on the second part, for example. So this is um, basically bringing in the stories from Storybook, but they are like layouted in, in as a, a documentation piece. Mm. Each one of them has the link. So as a designer, after my library is finished, you know somebody already set up this connection from Storybook to Figma. I can come back here and see. Oh, look, the avatars that the developers have access to is the large, the large RTL, the medium, the small. So it's useful for me to have those components accessible for me to make designs, but it's also useful for me to know what is out there in mm -hmm. one view. And I don't have to come out of my familiar space, right? You can also find this information just going through Storybook. But here, it's all within the environment that the designer is familiar with. Right. So I, I really like to build my files with this step of the process as well. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is really cool. Um, and then I, I saw another thing that, that I just want to highlight here, which is that if I click on this and then scroll down, the plugin actually gives me the ability to like jump to the story, yep. which is really cool. Uh, let me actually open this though. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably blocking you. Yep. And it, it drops me right into not just like what I did, but it like pops into the it like added all the properties so if we set these up like that's just that's really cool that that all works that's correct so for the developer this is great right because 
now they know exactly uh, which definitions in their code they need to uh, come up with in order to build up that design. So in when you go back to Figma, Figma also has this inspect feature. Where was I? Here. Yeah. So for example, um, now you finished your product design and you hand it over to the developers. They will look at the design, uh, probably through on the right panel, the inspect tab. And in there, down there, you see, because you have the button selected, the, there is a link to view documentation as well. Oh, cool. So that's the same thing as you saw previously. It's just uh, here is the environment in which probably the developer would be more familiar with because they are after this information. Um, and we because we imported all these components from Storybook, this link can be made. So they actually don't have to look at the rest of the properties that have been outlined by Figma because this is just CSS that Figma outputs. Mm -hmm. But in the end, if you have a design system, you don't need that information. You just need to know which component this is, what are the controls that I need to define to Well, and check this, this out too, because it shows that, you know, we have the, like, which variant are we using? Is it disabled? What size is it? So we're actually able to do all of these other pieces as well, which is, which is really interesting. And it's something that George has mentioned in the chat as well. So this is about the designer and the developer working more together to make the component work for both worlds, right? So the developer defining the stories that make sense to them as a documentation, but also what makes sense to generate Figma variants. So that really is them working hand in hand to get a component that is useful for everybody. So also the terminology that is used here, if you use this property of Boolean, true and false, does it make sense? And you start educating designers more on these definitions that come heavily from development, but they are very useful. Mm -hmm. It's very nice to know that you can set a Boolean um, and, and it's either false or true, right? Um, I think Figma already helped us think, like bring our mentality more towards this direction. But even now more uh, when you have such a plugin that actually is making those definitions um, already visible to you as a designer. Right. Like running this plugin at first, you're going to be like, okay, but what do the developer means by size? Is it the total size of the button, like the height of it? Or is it just like the three different sizes that we define in the design system? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of discussions to, to happen uh, in order to everybody understand what you're talking about right yeah i mean it, i can definitely see like anytime you're building out a design system you are um you're dealing with this idea of like designs drift over time uh and the i i, I go back to my conversation with dan mall all the time because anytime i talk to dan mall i feel like my brain expands a little bit but um he he talks <laughs> totally. about these, I, these I concepts him. of intention versus drift right and and when you have something brand new you almost always need to drift a little bit which means things are ambiguous and they're kind of spreading out and it's a little messy uh and as you start to see how things are used you have to do that difficult work of editing and clamping down and drawing boundaries around things and that's where that shared uh those shared definitions come in the shared terminology but also in agreement that like hey yeah i know that in this one design that a border radius might work but every other design that we're doing doesn't use that so we have to agree we're not doing it here like i know you don't like it but we have to agree the system needs to be like set right and and these are the sorts of things where and and like you know as as any system matures it it gets both more robust because we've covered more edge cases, but also more restrictive because we're adding constraints that say, this is what it feels like to be our system. Um, so what I like about what we're doing here is that those constraints feel like they can kind of emerge naturally through use where I could start by saying, can we just agree on what a button looks like? Like that's all. That's all I want is for us to agree on what a button looks like. And we say yes, we put it in Storybook, and then we import it into Figma. And now the designers and the developers have all agreed we will always use this component. Everything else can be drifting, right? But we've gotten intentional about our buttons. And then over time, as things emerge and as, as we start to see more patterns, we can just add a couple more components. And, and every time we do that, now we can import that into Figma and we get 
you know, a, a predictable design, predictable code. And whenever we find something that doesn't meet our needs, we can go in and just add a variant, add a setting, whatever it is to give us the, the flexibility to accomplish that. But it's always syncing, right? And it, it stops being this thing where the designers want it to be a certain way, but then the developers have to go and like fight to get all of their code updated, but they're never going to get that work prioritized because that's just not how companies work, right? You can't say, all right, we're going to stop all feature work for six months while we go in and overhaul the design system. It's just, unfortunately, yeah. that's not how things go, right? But no, exactly. we can sneak in a button component. Every time that we work on a UI, we can replace the hard-coded button with our, our button component. And we just slowly, you know, the whole UI turns over and eventually we're using mostly components. Um, and that's, you know, yeah. as, as sad as that is, that, that maybe is the state of things, right? And this feels like a great way to have that conversation in a, in a controlled and centralized way. Yeah. Additionally, I would say also there is the reality in which you as a designer is starting a team that already has something going on. Like that was the case for me actually with Death Riots. They they have been working on design systems. We have our own design system way before I started, and now I wanted to jump in and get going with making UI improvements to mm. our product, but I had to define all those components in Figma again, and like how many libraries have I built so far? You know, right. it's always the same same process. Only if could I inherit something that is already in code pick the well luckily now we have a plugin <laughs> but i think yeah the, the reality for those like say freelancers that are joining a new team that already has a storybook set up and they can just kickstart the entire design process because they have uh, at ease uh, access a mm. full library exactly at their brands right like it's not a generic library that they have to adapt and, and change to make it fit that client's brand they can just work with the their own one and also there is the um, option in which like you said the developer can go ahead like they've seen a component that has been used in the the product they already developed they can include it in the design system the designer is busy with other jobs and now hey there is a new component free for you available very quickly mm -hmm. you don't have to try to do it and try to keep up with what the developers are doing what the designers are doing like everybody can like start work walking at the same pace or mm -hmm. at least pretty close at this point yeah yeah i mean it's it, it's all like looking at this i can feel you know, there every team is going to have to work out their specific communication style and make sure that they can agree on the way things go. But this feels like a good tool for facilitating that conversation. Um, and especially, you know, as we, as, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, the, the worlds are growing together. Designers and developers are not discrete entities that don't speak anymore. It's, it's now very much an overlapping Venn diagram where you, you need design at every stage of the development process and you need developers to weigh in really early in the design process because everything that's happening, they all have dependencies, right? If we're designing for the web, the web has support and developers need to give a heads up that like, hey, you're doing something that's going to be really, really hard to develop. And designers need to, to be paying attention all the way through implementation to say, hey, that doesn't feel as good as we thought it would. Like, let's yeah. let's revisit that interaction. Um, so, Tice, this is this is so much good information. So many so many good things are happening. Um, where should people go if they want to learn more about this so i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna do the obvious thing and throw people the story to design um yeah, are there any other resources place. or articles or, yeah. or things that you want people to review so, no definitely uh, we have backlight.dev as uh, the main product that uh, we div at div rats work with and backlight website is also a great resource for articles around design systems so when you go to the resources you will resources see, here we go yeah I can there's click a the blog uh, space and over there we we try to keep up and publishing like all the knowledge that we have um around you know um workflows and processes and tools uh, other design systems for inspirations we also have within backlight um the section mastery that we are basically, we want to make the ultimate university around design system where people can uh, really know all the details that it takes to make a good design system, to document it, to build your design kits. So yeah, Backlight being the tool for um, 
the place where you're going to build, develop, maintain, and document your design system. I think it's a great resource. Story to design, to find out more about the plugin, you will uh, follow the link and you will, once uh, you install the plugin, you can sign up for the, the demo we'll give you and see if the private beta is a, uh, an interesting step for you. We also will uh, release this plugin publicly later this year. Um, the, so keep an eye on that. We'll be announcing it on Twitter. You know, or if you want, we also have a Discord channel. There's so many channels to, to join, actually. <laughs> but uh, everything is connected. Uh, you will find information in the Backlight website here. Uh, what else? Uh, the plugin, as we went through it in the demo, it works with Storybook and it also works with Backlight. I, I think, of course, because this is a uh, short ish uh, episode we, we cannot explore all the different possibilities mm -hmm. in, in one go but it's also really fun to see it work with Echolight and to to see different workflows around um yeah how to set up this uh, you know steps processes around designers developers from code to design from design to code i think there's mm -hmm. just so many scenarios to walk through in when building a design system i wish i could showcase them all in one episode <laughs> that's just too much <laughs> well here's here's what i will do is i'm going to send everybody back toward your twitter again so that uh anybody who is watching who wants to learn more can dive in here and get a better sense of oh boy i'm definitely showing off my dms don't look at that uh so anybody <laughs> who wants to can can dive in here and see what's going on and uh you know get a good sense of of how all this stuff fits together by following your content and uh you know i'll sure i'm sure you'll be sharing other people's content in the design system space yeah. so um if you are interested make sure you head over here and hit that follow button that i apparently hadn't hit so here we go now i'm following <laughs> <laughs> it's okay you, you have a lot of people to follow so i completely understand <laughs> um but so uh okay so with that, I think we're going to call this one a, a glowing success. Even with a Figma incident, we were still able to get this all set up, get our design system imported. And it, I just want to like, just very quickly reiterate that we like, this is extraordinarily cool how quickly we were able to jump in here and build out a really functional library so that we could build this tiny little form UI. Um, I didn't have to design a dang thing. I just dragged stuff out from my assets and built out this little form, right? Um, yep. So this is this is really powerful stuff and something that I, I encourage everybody to definitely go in and try. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I yeah. have the, all the design system that I generated from um, Story to Design. I will publish it in the Figma community as a file the moment that my Figma comes back because mine is still out okay. <laughs> for some reason. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll publish it in Twitter. So for those people following or it, they will be able to find it out and you can play with these components yourself. Mm -hmm. So you won't be able to play with the plugin yet unless you take part on our beta, but at least you get to see what got generated um, by the plugin. Really fun stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that is some very, very cool stuff. Make sure you get on that wait list for for story to design so that you get access to it as soon as it becomes available to everyone. Um, and let's do one more shout out. We have had Vanessa with white coat captioning here with us all day today doing the, the live captioning thing. Thank you so much for that. That's made possible through the support of our sponsors, Netlify, NX and Backlight. So thank you, Tyson team. Um, that is uh, that you know that means a lot. It helps keep the show running, gives us a lot of opportunities to do things that would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I need to update the schedule because it is looking pretty light in here. But here's here's the thing: we got a good episode coming up on Thursday. Uh, I have um, the the web page test team coming on. I think Henri is in the chat today. Uh, we are going to be learning about some really incredible stuff. If you've been following Catchpoint or Web Page Test, you may have seen that they have uh, some new tools on Web Page Test for running experiments, and those are powered by Netlify Edge functions. And I am just absolutely thrilled to give this a shot, show you all how it works, and and just you know, I hope you're, I hope you get as excited about this as I am because it's incredible. Um, we I'll be updating the schedule this week. I'll try to get it done today so that you can see all the other episodes that we have coming. But we've got a lot of good stuff. It's going to be a really fun month. 
Thank you all, as always, for hanging out. We're going to go find somebody to raid. Tice, any parting words for the chat before we end? Oh, yes. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for this awesome uh, invitation to, to be part of your show, but also really congratulate you on the format that you have going. I think it's really cool. Very engaging. You put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's never seen what you're about to present, and you're just able to really dissect it in a, in a very understandable way. I think it's really nice for really learning something new with you every time that you come live. It's really cool. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to put that in my warm fuzzy bank and use it for the rest of the week. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Tice, thank you so much for taking some time to teach us today. It was super, super fun. Chat, as always, thank you. Stay tuned for the raid. We're going to go see uh, Ben for Semantics Dev. Uh, we will see you all next time. Thanks, everybody.